Welcome. Well, welcome everybody. I think I think there'll be some more people filtering in in the next couple of minutes, but just to keep us on track, I thought I would start the introductions that you probably really don't need to hear from our speakers. But um, we are uh, we're very fortunate today. You know, one of one of the uh, we spoke about this on our last meeting, but you know, one of the benefits of this new Zoom culture we live in is that it's much easier to connect us across time zones. So. Today, the, the speakers we're going to hear from are spanning 10 time zones. <laughs> so we're literally from Los Angeles to Tel Aviv, and, uh, and we have a lot of South Africans and, and people from other places in between. So it, it's going to be a, a, a really nice meeting, and I'm happy to welcome you all. I'm just going to flip over here in the beginning, let's see here, share my screen, give you a little context for our discussion as people fold in. There we go. And there. Um, so let me again just, just welcome you, welcome you um, to this workshop. So this is, a, this is a public workshop of this meeting. I, I apologize for some of you who, who may have um, tried to attend a workshop earlier this year that we had to reschedule but so this is the rescheduled workshop and we will also be recording this so for people that couldn't um, attend that you want to share we'll have that link it'll probably take about a week to get it back up but on the same page as the event we will have a, a recording of, of today's event um, so just before introducing our speakers I'd like to present a little context that frames the topic of the day um, and that's uh, this, this is really part of a series of meetings discussing some of the more controversial parts of the South African Copyright Reform Bill. And that, that process, the process that led to that bill began formally in 2011, um, so almost a decade ago, although the changes have really been under consideration long before that. Um, and the, the Copyright Amendment, a bill that was ultimately adopted and became referred to as a hybrid approach to limitations and exceptions which matched a, a slight revision really of its of its existing long list of specific exceptions that were already in the bill with the addition of an opening of its fair dealing right or a replacing of its fair dealing right with an open fair use clause the the key difference of which is is to include you know the word such as before the list of enumerated purposes so that it, it could be potentially applicable to any any fair use and i just want to just briefly show to you the two provisions that are that are referred to as hybrid so the first one here is the fair use clause and so that's in section 12a of the bill and you'll notice that its, its structure is we, very we similar. We can't see that. You cannot see yeah, that. I'm not seeing the, the speaker's notes instead yeah. of the, instead of You need to put it on the display. I am sharing the wrong slide, yeah. okay. Um, the difference is I'm sharing the wrong screen. Sorry about that. Does that work? Are you now seeing the, yep. that works? I'm not there. Someone's not? <laughs> well, maybe it's me. I, I, um, is everyone else seeing it? We're looking at 12 AA, right? All right. 12 AA, yeah. Let me see if this still works. Okay. Um, so this, this is, it should be on your screen, <laughs> a version of the, of the fair use provision which is structured similarly to the United States Fair Use Provision in that the first part of the clause has um, an opening of the purposes that are 
um, eligible for the fairness test, which is in B. And a couple differences from the US clause. I mean, one is that the list of, of enumerated purposes is longer. So it includes explicitly some items that one would find in um, U US fair use case law, like parody and satire, caricature, et cetera. But it, it includes those specifically in list purposes. And then in the second provision, includes the fairness test. And the fairness test has four parts, but um, has some added enumeration within those. So it, it relatively directly incorporates the transformative use test in um, three, and it explicitly refers to institution effect as being the one that is relevant to the, the market in the fourth factor. And so one of the things we can discuss is, is the extent to which um, this test is similar or different to the fair use tests elsewhere that some of our um, professors have been studying. Now, I have to see whether I can show the next, there we go, are we seeing part B? So in addition to the fair use test, there is a retention of a list that's now called 12B of a list of purposes, many of which could be read as incorporated within the fair use itself. So largely, this is language that was already in the South Africa Act. Some of it's been tweaked, you know, very slightly over the margins. Um, but you see it starts with a quotation, you know, right, which would be um, a canonical fair use right, you know, illustration as a purpose. And then there's a relatively long list, including broadcasting, current news, demonstrating electronic commitment, use in judicial proceedings, personal use, including format shifting, making backup copies, et cetera. And then a, a, a series of additional exceptions that are new to the bill, including temporary reproduction, education, reverse engineering, special library exception, and disability clause. So it has a relatively rich list of specific exceptions and also an open fair use clause. And I'll just, you know, end by the, the final plot point in this, in this story is that the president specifically referred to that combination of the open fair use clause and a number of specific exceptions. So you see 12A is listed, B is listed, which is the specific exceptions, and all of those additional clauses with exception of the disability clause were listed by the president as violating both the international three-step test and either taken together or separately little violating the constitutional rights to property. So there's just a specific rejection of this approach of having a long list of specific exceptions combined with a fair use exception. So that really sets us up for our presentations today. Um, and we're very happy to have, as I mentioned, the presenters spanning over 10 time zones. We'll start off with Peter Yu from Texas A&M University, um, who's done uh, two different pieces on the trends of transplanting fair use, both of which concentrate in different ways on this trend towards adopting hybrid exceptions to help give us context for those choices within the bill. And then um, Neva Elkin-Koren and Neil Nathaniel have just published, I, I don't even know if it's out in print yet, but, but their most recent article um, presenting an empirical study on the last 15 years or so of application of fair use within Israel um, and uh, displaying so, some of the choices courts had made in the context of not having, you know, 200 years of case law like the United States, a, a point that's often raised as kind of an objection to adopting fair use elsewhere. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Peter. After our presentations, we'll um, invite, invite discussion from all of you. I, th I think we have at least one representative of South African creative industry that has been um, promoting fair use. And we also have um, a member of the coalition who's been opposing fair use. And we'd love to hear from both of them if that's possible, although there might be some technicalities in getting them both on the line, but we'll do our best. Um, and we also have a number of people in the room that have been to South Africa and study South Africa specifically. So I think it'll be a very rich discussion. Peter, over to you, welcome. Okay, so um, it's a pleasure to be here. You guys can hear me? Yes, okay, good. So what I'm going to talk about is um, 
uh, something I put together based on the two articles that uh, Sean has circulated earlier. And so my focus here will be on uh, failure transplants and how to customize it. Um, so uh, as Sean uh, started off earlier, um, I mentioned I've been involved uh, in some of those issues and I was a pro bono advisor for the corporate reform in Hong Kong. And um, I think it would be especially useful for some of the participants here. Uh, Israel obviously uh, was, uh, has strong ties to the British legal system. And then for South Africa, it was a former British colony. So a lot of those issues will be quite similar. And so, so far we have seen a number of countries adopting fair use. And so this is just a very good example of the different countries that have been going in that direction. So what I want to start off with is uh, some basics about legal transplant. Um, I will not spend too much time, uh, but it will be good to know that there are benefits and there are drawbacks. So benefits is that you can free ride on other countries' legislative effort. You can introduce well-tested laws from abroad if you actually like the model from elsewhere. You can draw lessons from foreign countries, both for good and bad. You can initiate preemptive defense in light of the fact that uh, fair use has already been adopted in other countries. And you can also facilitate international harmonization. Considering that a lot of countries have already adopted fair use, then it actually can be quite useful from the perspective of international harmonization. But there are also drawbacks. It can stifle local development, especially if the fair use model is not suitable to local conditions. So it can upset local traditions for the similar reasons. Uh, it can reduce opportunities for experiments. If all countries are adopting similar models, that can actually make it more difficult for countries to adopt new experiments. It can import problems from abroad to the extent that people do not like some of the problems created by the fair use system in the US or elsewhere. You can actually bring in some of those problems. It can also be ineffective in light of the mismatch between the local conditions. So those are basically the benefits and the drawbacks. So the key to avoid the drawbacks and maximize the benefits is customization. So the majority of the talk will focus on uh, the different ways to customize fair use in light of the local conditions. So what I've uh, done in the article as well as in this presentation is to share with you guys the eight different modalities of transplantation uh, based on the different proposals or different legislation that has been adopted in other countries. So the first modality is basically just copy the, uh, the transplant, uh, copy the uh, fair use model verbatim. And we have seen this one, for example, in Liberia. You look at uh, uh, section 2.7 of the Copyright Act, you can see that it's basically very similar to section 107 of the Copyright Statute. You have the fair use uh, factors right there. You have the preamble. A lot of the issues are basically very similar. The only exception is that uh, the fair use will not be applicable to reproduction of computer program that's at the very bottom of the slide. And so that, to some extent, will be quite similar to what Sean mentioned early on with respect to a hybrid approach. And we also have something similar uh, in Malaysia. If you actually look at what Malaysia has done with respect to sec Section 13, so in two section, uh, two, uh, uh, 13 2A, you can actually see the fairness factors included right there. It's basically a verbatim transplant from the U.S. fair use model. The second modality is to add the three-step test. And I think that is relevant in light of uh, the rejection uh, in South Africa. And so this is the model that's been taken up in South Korea. So what they have done is actually include the last two steps of the three steps within the preamble of this, uh, uh, the phase provision. So if you look at uh, uh, section two and you have the four factors, but section one includes the second step and the third step. And then I think the uh, the, both the preamble with respect to news reporting, criticism, education, as well as the fairness factors will pertain to the first uh, uh, step of the three-step test. The third modality is to add regulatory authority. And uh, the only country I've seen is Israel. Uh, and uh, because uh, Nifa and Neil will uh, continue to talk about this one, so I'm not going to spend too much time. But I will note that within section C there, uh, there's a provision saying that the minister may make regulation prescribing conditions 
under which a fair use uh, a use shall be deemed as fair use. And so that's included and that's not available in other countries. The fourth modality is to add deference to a side agreement, usually uh, in the private sector. And so the best example is from Taiwan, where you can look at section 65, where they actually include a provision saying that where the corporate owner and the organization, uh, the corporate owner organization and the exploiter organization have formed an agreement on the scope of fair use, then they will take that into consideration, right? So that is uh, not included within the law, but at the same time, if you negotiate something outside, you will still be considered. And I think a very good example would be that if you want to set about code of practice uh, based on industry, you can actually incorporate the code of practice into the various provisions. The fifth modality is to mix the transplant with fair dealing. And so I think that is as close to the hybrid as you can find. And I think we have seen this one in a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, and so the example I got here is Singapore. And I think uh, this is very similar to what we are now seeing in uh, South Africa. So in section 35, there's the fair use provision that's been adopted after Singapore signed the US, uh, the future agreement with the United States, but they we decide to retain the existing section 36 and section 37 with respect to criticism or review and reporting current events. So you basically have the fair use provision in section 35 and then you have the existing fair dealing provisions in section 36 and 37. Another example we got is in Sri Lanka. So they basically add fair use, but at the same time, use the existing fair dealing provisions uh, and limitation exceptions to actually define uh, what type of circumstances is included within fair use. And so that's in section 11 in Sri Lanka. And so you can see the last uh, highlighted line uh, on, on the slide, the fair use shall include the circumstances specified in other provision. So it's also a hybrid approach as well. Uh, the sixth modality is to require the priority consideration of fair delay. I think to the extent that I think uh, uh, those in South Africa are very concerned about uh, the uh, complication or the confusion with respect to different provisions, uh, this is actually quite interesting. So this is a proposal came from the Corporate Review Committee from Ireland. And so they did a big report and what they proposed is that they will include uh, a, a particular uh, a provision uh, within the first uh, particular clause within the first provision, saying that the court shall not consider whether use constitute fair use without considering whether that use amounts to another act permitted by this part. So the idea is that they will consider other provisions first uh, before they actually consider whether this considered as fair use. The second modality is to include an illustrative list. And so the best example is what we have seen in the report from the Australian Law Review Commission. And so the proposal is to include a non-exhaustive list of illustrated uses and purposes. And that's in part to counteract a lot of the criticism of how fair use can be unpredictable and imprecise. And so that what they want to do is to include the different uses. And so with their recommendation, there are 11 illustrative purposes that be included so that people can look at uh, to see whether this actually will be considered as fair use. And I think a lot of those uh, uh, illustrative purposes are some of the exceptions that have been provided in the past. And so that can also be quite helpful to fold fair dealing into fair use. Uh, and we also have seen something similar uh, in the uh, report from Ireland, which I mentioned early on. And so if you look at here, they also include a clause saying that the other acts permitted by this part shall be regarded as examples of fair use. So that means existing provisions that are within the permitted acts or the limitation exceptions that will be included as examples of fair use. So that would provide some certainty as well. And the last modality I want to end on is about adding a general saving clause. And so uh, this is the approach uh, that uh, I've been uh, a, a lot of my, uh, uh, my allies and I have been advocating in Hong Kong. And so the idea is that there are already uh, different uh, fair dealing provisions. So the first four is uh, the pre-existing fair dealing provisions. Five, six, seven, and eight, and nine, and 10 are uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the bill included uh, 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 advanced by the, the government. Uh, and so that was the bill that's uh, uh, lapsed uh, uh, in 2000, uh, 2017, uh, uh, but at the same time, but at the same time, um, uh, uh, a lot of the 
internet user groups uh, and also internet service providers believe that this is not sufficient in light of uh, the technological changes. So what we have advocated is to actually include a general saving clause at the very end so that you have provided a catch-all uh, provision that will cover other unanticipated circumstances that are not listed in either the, uh, the existing uh, ordinance or the uh, new bill uh, advanced by the government. Uh, we also have something, seen something similar uh, in China. And so in the latest deliberation draft that's been advanced in August, uh, the, uh, uh, the, there's the provision uh, that's been, so uh, uh, the president provision uh, in uh, 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 cross th uh, 13 about other circumstances as provided by laws and administrative regulations. For those of you who have been following the uh, reform in China, you have seen this provision uh, being included in previous drafts and then it has been taken out in a draft in April and now it has been put back uh, instead of having just other circumstances, they also add uh, the, uh, the clause as provided by laws and administrative regulations. So that's the, uh, from the latest draft. Uh, so I want to end this presentation by sharing with you two different lessons. The first one is that there are good transplant or there are bad transplants. Now, if you are pro fair use, you can see fair use as a good transplant and legislation similar to the DMCA will be a bad transplant. But the same thing can also be said if you're on the other side, you can also look at the other way. And I think the important takeaway here is that uh, when we are transplanting laws from abroad, there will be problem. And so it's very important for us to actually do customization. We customize the, trans uh, the, the transplant model in light of the local conditions. The second lesson I want to share with you is that when we have the, uh, 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 the so this stood with respect to the first lesson. And so this from Alan Watson uh, in the book, what he said is that the time of reception is often a time when a provision is looked at closely hence the time when the law can be reformed uh, or be more sophisticated, right? So you can see that there's an opportunity for us to actually look at the transplant model, tailored to local conditions and make the current model even better in light of the local conditions. The second lesson I want to share with you is that uh, different countries have adopted different approaches in light of the, how they're going to transform uh, 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 the, the uh, phase regime or fair dealing regime and so you can actually have entry point at different levels. And so I think it's important for us to increasingly stay away from the argument about how there's a shift from fair dealing to fair use uh, is actually closer to an evolution, how we are just having everything within the spectrum and then we are moving in light of local conditions to adopt new provision and make the adjustment. So I'll stop here and let me turn it over to uh, Sean. Great, Peter, if you can stop sharing your screen and then we'll um, go over to Neva and Neil and whichever you guys want to speak first is, is great. Neil, you're on mute. Am I on mute? Neil, Neil. No, I'm not, right? Okay. Right, good. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. All right, does everybody see? That's good. Okay, terrific. All right, so uh, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, to Peter for your comments and your groundbreaking scholarship on fair use transplants, uh, and to Sean for organizing this rescheduled workshop. I very much look forward to our, our discussion. So Neve and I uh, have a forthcoming article presenting the results of our empirical study of fair use case law in, in Israel in comparison with fair use case law in the United States. Israel en enacted fair use as part of a general copyright revision uh, that culminated in Israel's copyright law 2007. Uh, and in that revision, uh, Israel replaced the previous fair dealing provision with uh, the current fair use provision. Neve and I conducted a quantitative statistical analysis of the first 10 years of fair use case law um, from May 19, 2008, which was the date that the copyright law of 2007 took effect. Uh, and we also discussed a landmark fair use ruling in the case of Nestle versus Espresso, uh, which the Israeli Supreme Court issued after our 10 year period in, in August 2019 
that case might pretend a significant shift in fair use doctrine in Israel. All right, so uh, Israel's fair use doctrine is not identical to Section 107 of the U.S. Copyright Act, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, and by the way, Peter mentioned uh, Section 19C of the Israel uh, Copyright Act, uh, which does give the Minister of Justice the authority to issue regulations further defining what is a fair use. Uh, let me just say that, uh, at least at this point, there have, 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 and it's already more than 10 years since the law took effect, uh, the minister has not issued any regulations. And I don't believe any such regulations are currently on the horizon. So um, uh, just to, to mention that. Um, all right, anyway, so as I said, Israel's uh, statute is quite similar to that of the United States. Nonetheless, as has happened repeatedly in countries that have adopted or have considered adopting some version of US fair use, U.S. copyright industry staunchly opposed the adoption of fair use in Israel. Uh, in particular, uh, in its submissions to the USTR, the International Intellectual Property Alliance contrasted the fair use provision in Israel with fair use law in the United States. According to the IIPA submission, uh, in the U.S., there are many years of jurisprudence have provided considerable clarity on the boundaries of fair use. But in Israel, there's a significant risk that the adoption of the fair use factors might be viewed as a free ticket to copy. This, the IIP asserted, would have disastrous consequences. And thus, we urge the Israeli government to re-examine the introduction of these factors, the fair use factors, rather than relying on the closed list of specific exceptions dealing with certain special cases uh, that was previously set out in Israel's fair dealing provision. All right, as I will discuss uh, shortly, um, our, our case study of the first decade of uh, Israeli fair use case law belies the U.S. copyright industry's concerns about Israel's adoption of fair use. While it's only one case study of how fair use has been interpreted and applied in a 10-year period in one country, we believe that our case study, at the very least, calls into question the sweeping opposition of U.S. copyright industries, and in some cases, the U.S. government, to transplanting fair use in other countries. So I'm going to briefly review our substantive findings and then turn it over to Neva. I'd be happy to discuss our methodology if anyone has any comments or questions, but I won't review that right now. All right, so first of all, uh, in this 10-year period that we examined in Israel, there were 55 reported rulings, of which uh, um, 51 were lower courts and four were Supreme Court rulings. In the United States, during that same 10-year period, there were 185 reported rulings, of which 157 were district court rulings, uh, 28 were appellate courts, and there were no Supreme Court rulings during that 10-year period. All right, interestingly, uh, Israeli courts accepted fair use defenses at a far lower rate than did U.S. courts during the first decade in which Israel's fair use statutory provision was in effect. In Israel, the defendant prevailed, the defendant claiming fair use, prevailed in just 29% of the cases. In the U.S. was almost half the cases, 49% of the cases, the defendant prevailed in the fair use defense. Now, uh, we, we did consider whether we, you know, we were considering like cases, maybe the case mix was different, maybe we're, we're, we're comparing apples and oranges. Um, we did rule out, and, and it's possible that there are some, there's some noise there and that some various reasons why the results might be different. Um, I will say that we, we did rule out various external factors like the types of litigants and the types of works at issue. None of those and any statistically significant correlation with fair use outcomes. Uh, we also reviewed all the cases in which Israeli courts considered the fair use defense to try to determine whether, in our opinion, U.S. courts would have held the same thing, would have come to the same result applying U.S. fair use doctrine. So in our view, uh, U.S. courts would have ruled the same as the Israeli courts in the majority of those cases. 
however, in our view, U.S. courts might well have accepted the fair use defense in some non-trivial number of the cases in which Israeli courts rejected fair use. In addition, there was all, at least one Israeli uh, trial court ruling in which the court accepted a fair use defense that would never have succeeded in the U.S., uh, but that Israeli lower court ruling was reversed by the Israeli Supreme Court uh, on appeal. Uh, at any rate, our, our subjective analysis supports our view that the lower win rate for fair use defendants in Israel appears to stem from the fact that Israeli courts have weighed certain factors heavily against fair use, while those factors are given very little weight in the United States. Uh, the first of those is the commercial nature of the defendant's use. Right. Where the use is found to be commercial, uh, in Israel, courts found that the use is a fair use in only 10% of the cases. In the United States, by contrast, 50% of the cases where the use was found to be commercial were nonetheless found to be fair use by the U.S. court. And in the United States, where the use was found to be both transformative and commercial, U.S. courts ruled in favor of fair use in over 90% of the cases. Secondly, uh, the defendant's failure to give authorship credit. Israeli courts rejected fair use in all but one of the 22 cases where the court found that the defendant had failed to give authorship credit. In the United States, this is just a non-issue in fair use doctrine. I mean, there's a very, very small handful of cases uh, throughout the history of fair use that have addressed this. Um, it's hardly mentioned at all. Right, in U.S. fair use jurisprudence, the, the, the need or the requirement or the, the issue of giving authorship credit. Right, thirdly, uh, a finding that the defendant's use is not among the favored uses that are enumerated in the fair use statute, right, in the inter introductory clause of the fair use statute. In Israel, 90% of the rulings that found that the use in question was not one of the enumerated uses, rejected fair mm -hmm. use. Um, and that we think uh, owes itself to a the continuing influence of fair dealing jurisprudence in Israel. And I'll, I'll leave that to Neva to comment on if she, if she wishes um, after, after I'm uh, finished talking. Uh, so again, the, 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 the greater emphasis on, in Israel on the first clause, which, which lists the the favorite uses than, than in the United States. In the United States, we, didn't, we did not check the percentages, uh, but commentators and courts often emphasize that the enumerated uses are merely illustrative examples. And, and Barton Beebe, in a different empirical study of US uh, figures case law, found that a judicial finding that the use is not among the enumerated uses did not significantly affect case outcomes on the issue of fair use. All right, finally, uh, it's noteworthy that the question of whether the defendant's use is transformative, which dominates U.S. fair use jurisprudence, had little impact on Israeli lower courts during the first decade of Israeli fair use case law. However, uh, <clears throat> the issue of transformative use was twice mentioned by the Israeli Supreme Court during that decade and was fully embraced by the Israeli Supreme Court and Nesty versus Espresso, right, decided, decided in August 2019. Uh, and, that, and, that, and that ruling, the Israeli Supreme Court has expressly referred to Campbell versus Akoff Rose, the number of, uh, of points in its, in its ruling. All right, so the bottom line then is that the Israeli approach differs from the US approach, uh, but in a way that, at least up until now, is, has been less favorable to fair use defenses than in, the, than in the U.S. Now, of course, our case study is just a 10-year snapshot. Uh, as we discuss, Nessie versus Espresso brings Israeli fair use doctrine closer to that of the U.S. And, and therefore might in the future engender greater receptivity to the fair use defense among Israeli courts. But in any event, right, it is quite clear that the U.S. copyright industry concern that Israel's enactment of fair use would undermine 
uh, copyright holder rights has not come to fruition. Now, again, this is just a case study, but I think at the very least we can draw two broader conclusions, conclusions of relevance to the global debate about the adoption of fair use or something like fair use. Firstly, uh, contrary to what appears to be the position of the IIPA, the mere fact that a country adopts fair use should not serve as a basis for imposing trade sanctions um, at the US, USTR uh, on that country. It is, is, it is not evidence that that country provides inadequate protection to intellectual property rights. And secondly, we need further case studies in other countries to test the copyright industry's sweeping unsubstantiated claim that without the benefit of decades of US fair use precedent, foreign courts will apply fair use in a chaotic fashion and will undermine copyright in the, in the process. Okay, that's, um, I'll now uh, turn the mic over to Neva. I'll get out of shared screen. So, um, thanks. I'd like to um, keep my comments really brief and to just uh, add briefly on, on, on the findings that um, Neil uh, presented um, uh, and actually share some thoughts about um, um, Peter, uh, Peter's overview of uh, transplanting uh, fair use. And I think that, Peter, if you were warning us that, um, of, um, uh, that transplanting could stifle local traditions and upset um, um, the local development of law, I think that uh, what we're seeing in our findings is actually the way in which um, the, uh, the courts could, could play a very important role in mitigating these effects. And so just briefly, three lessons based on our study. One, I think, uh, would be that, the, that legal reform is always gradual. And so if fair use exception was sort of, uh, uh, was anticipated in Israel and uh, raised a lot of expectations when it was passed by the parliament um, among educators, among startup companies, among independent creators, uh, we ended up with these somewhat disappointing findings that it didn't make so much of a difference. At the same time, when you think about the reasons, uh, they probably have to do with the local tradition and the courts. And so the court in and of itself is a very conservative institution. Practitioners in Israel were trained by uh, under fair dealing regime. Judges were trained under fair dealing regime. Legal interpretation rely on legal precedents that were held under fair dealing regime. And that is actually shaping the approach of the court. And I think that the most uh, interesting example is the way in which a similar statutory language to the US fair use um, 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 uh, statute is actually being interpreted by the court and more recently, um, even more strongly by the Supreme Court as a two-pronged test where you, first of all, need to um, 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 determine whether the use falls under the enumerated uh, purposes, indeed an open list of purposes, now that it is fair use, but this is a preliminary test to move on to the four factors analysis. So this is something uh, that has been in, introduced by the court. And I think that it is framed by the um, analytic framework that judges and practitioners have been trained on. Um, second, I think is the is a second lesson uh, to be drawn is that legal reform um, depend and is rooted on local traditions. And here, when we look at the case law and, uh, and when Neil and I were looking at the findings, 
uh, we thought that another explanation for the conservative approach that has been taken, may, maybe not conservative approach, but the local approach or local interpretation uh, that has been taken uh, by the uh, Israeli courts um, could be explained by uh, um, general jurisprudential principles that uh, are actually uh, more characteristic of the Israeli jurisprudence, and that is uh, less formalism and uh, a loose interpretation of, um, of, of the statute that is based on the purpose of the statute. So um, this has been part of the general trend by the Supreme Court that uh, was led by uh, the former president of the Supreme Court, uh, the um, uh, Justice Aaron Barak, that has been followed, a uh, Dworkian approach that is looking um, at um, the interpretation of laws is, is, is based on its purpose and the overarching principles. And if we look at the principles, that are driving Israeli private law, these are unjust enrichment. And another overarching principle is good faith. And so when you try to explain why courts are putting emphasis on commercial purpose or putting emphasis on whether the defendant gave credit or not, that may be rooted in these overarching principles that are also influencing uh, the court. A third lesson um, is, um, is actually, um, I think, uh, is, is something that um, um, I think uh, could be a lesson for um, not just for the US, for, for the non-US countries that are thinking about adapting fair use, but also um, to US um, uh, jurists that are actually um, um, interpreting fair use. And that is that when you export the legal doctrine, it can actually come back to you with some new ideas and innovative ideas. So that we, once we start to think of a more global doctrine, that could be informed and enriched by some innovative ideas that are coming from other places, um, I think the doctrine uh, um, could develop. And what we've seen in the recent Supreme Court case that Neil has mentioned, the Nestle case, is that the Supreme Court of Israel is taking the, because it is shifting from a formal interpretation of the law into uh, one that is based on the purpose of law, the court is saying if the purpose of law is actually to cultivate um, the creation of creative works and if fair use is um, a mechanism that should actually enable this, we should maybe think of the four factors and reclassify them, still use them, but reclassify them according to three tests uh, looking at the way in which the infringing work, as, as to whether the infringing work is promoting a socially valuable objective, looking at the way in which it impairs um, the incentives for re the original authors, and al also looking at proportionality. And you can act nicely actually reclassify the four factors under these three tests. The court is still doing the four-factor analysis, but I think is developing a fresh conceptual framework for analyzing fair use that could inform not just the legal jurisprudence in Israel, but also elsewhere where other courts are developing the doctrine. I'd like to just add a, a final comment of um, causes when we are looking at our findings we were um, looking at the numbers and the case law and only focusing on, on what happened in the courts. And I think that all of us know that a lot is also happening um, you know, outside the court, right? Much of the law is actually happening outside the court, but that would require uh, sociological, right? Um, or an economic 
studies that would look at the impact of fair use over the past 10 years, and then that is something that we haven't measured in our study, uh, but I think, uh, so, so just to, it, it's really important to keep it in context and know that we only look at the narrow aspect of the impact of this legal reform over the past 10 years in Israel. Thank you. <clears throat> thank, thank you all. Um, um, I've, I've got a couple of ringers who I'd like to point out for our first couple of comments, but if people would like to make comments or questions, please go to the, the participant tab and click on the more button and you'll see a way to, to raise your hand there and, and we can start getting in, in that queue. Um, I mean, a couple, a couple of themes that I just kind of take away from the combination of these two research um, components is that, you know, in the statutory making, hybridization is desirable, if not inevitable, you know, taking Peter's work. And then in the implementation, differentiation is at least inevitable, if not desirable from, from Eva and Emil's work. Um, and that, and that those, those kind of observations from the empirical and, and theoretical literature, I think, you know, can help inform, you know, countries like South Africa that are thinking about their policy mix. So I'd love the two. So, so Ruth, I see you hiding behind Lauren Faz's name. And, Neil, has, and, Neil has and, got her. Oh, uh, Neil, do you want a quick reply? Well, to I'd love to take Peter and Ruth next. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. If, there, if there's a queue, then. Uh, no, no, no. You're You've got a special place in the queue. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I want to say with respect, <laughs> respect to the hybridization, I, I, I frankly don't really understand what the. the um, I know this came up with in South Africa in particular. Like I, I don't understand the argument because um, US, U.S. fair use was also a hybrid system. I mean, the U.S. Copyright Act, sections 108 through sections 118, are a whole list of over, of over a dozen specific exceptions. And under U.S. copyright law, fair use stands independently from those exceptions. Some of those exceptions would not qualify as fair use. Some might. It doesn't really matter. They stand independently from one another. So. The United States has a hybrid system. So I, I, I don't understand the, maybe I'm missing something, but I, I just don't understand the criticism of, I, I, maybe I can understand the criticism of particular exceptions in South Africa, but I don't understand the criticism of the basic approach that is both fair use and specific exception because that's a transplant of the US system. It's not, and I think as Peter pointed out, every lots of countries, maybe every country that has adopted fair use has that kind of hybrid approach. Um, and and you, you mentioned differentiation. That's, that's sort of a major, you know, Neva really emphasized that. Um, I just want to say something quickly about that too, which is, you know, it, as, as is evident from our study and as Neva emphasized, you know, it's really fair use is, is quite distinct in many ways from U.S. fair use. And we would anticipate that would be true in, in every country, given its own local tradition and, and jurisprudence. Um, but I do want to emphasize that difference doesn't necessarily mean chaos and um, um, opening up or used to you know, opening up the copper system to piracy that hasn't been the case in Israel and there's no particular reason to expect it to be true in other countries. You know, Ruth, let's, let's go to you first and then Peter Yazzie if we can, if I know both of you, I'm turning to you first because both of you have been to South Africa and have been studying both fair use generally but also the South African context specifically so i wonder any any reflections you'd like to share maybe turning to you first ruth um i'm going to defer to peter because i can call you lauren if you want me to <laughs> <laughs> no i'm going to defer to peter um uh, i want peter to go first and then i, I okay can follow up. okay <laughs> that's very generous i think um <laughs> let me see what i can do i i i wanted to make sort of three sets of observations each one i uh, ending with a question for anyone. And the, the first set of observations is about US law. And it's the one I feel most comfortable and grounded in. And I think the question it ends up with is a largely rhetorical question, which in a way Neil has already posed. But just a, a, a few observations based on what, what Peter and, and Neil and Neva have said about the the real condition of U.S. law. One thing that needs to be said and said again is that 
there has never been any ambiguity in U.S. law about the open-ended nature of the list of uses in the preamble. Um, the legislative history and every judicial consideration of that list since that time has made it absolutely clear that that is an illustrative rather than an exhaustive list. And that's what makes it an open exception. So crucial to any meaningful transplant of the idea, if not the literal language of fair use, is that notion that whatever list of uses may be involved to introduce or illustrate the principle that has to be, by definition, an open rather than a closed list. Uh, another observation goes to the fascinating uh, data about the relevance of issues of, of credit and attribution in Israeli law that that, that Neil and, and Neva's wonderful article has, has surfaced. And again, it's absolutely true that this is not a common, overt, and certainly, as far as I know, never a formally determinative criterion in U.S. law. There is a kind of cloud of uncertainty in U.S. fair use jurisprudence around the issue of the significance of good faith and bad faith. And there are th that, that, that area of uncertainty about which there is both scholarly, uh, the, rele the, the, the relevance of these considerations is a matter of both scholarly and judicial disagreement, but it's certainly a, it is certainly an, 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 a route through which considerations of attribution could, and I think sometimes do, implicitly under fair use jurisprudence. The most fascinating thing to me, which many of you will already know, is that in the 15 years that we've been doing so-called fair use codes of best practices with various practice groups, every practice community with which we have ever consulted regards attribution as an essential aspect of doing fair use right whether the law says so or not, which goes back a little bit to Neva's point about law and practice. So Neil made my most important point about the US already, which is that obviously the US is a hybrid system in exactly the sense that Peter and others had, Peter described it and others have been describing it either positively or, or critically as the case may be. And in fact, I would venture haven't done the work, so I can't be sure that to say that um, every fair use or fair use like system anywhere in the world is in fact hybrid in nature, including at least some specific exceptions along with the open exception. So my first challenge, my first question is really a challenge. Can anyone name a fair use like law anywhere in the world that does not have some characteristics of hybridity. Second thing I wanted to talk about a little bit, and here I'm on, on less firm ground by far, is the South African situation. Sean showed us earlier a paragraph from the president's letter, in effect, uh, knocking, or, knocking the, the copyright amendment bill back to the parliament. And I'm, I am not, I think it's careful not to overread the paragraph that, that Sean displayed, that long list of, of sections beginning with 12A, going through the, the, the hybrid exceptions or the, the specific exceptions and concluding with the proposition that taken together they may or they probably do infringe either the property right or the three-step test. Putting to one side the thing that continues to mystify me about that paragraph, which is what in the world the three-step test, which is an international obligation, has to do with constitutional analysis in South Africa, given that the only basis on which the president is constitutionally permitted to reject legislation is on the basis of a constitutional objection. Putting that to one side, because I simply don't get that, and maybe somebody can explain it to me. 
I'm not convinced that the language that we see in that paragraph is a constitutional objection to hybridity as such, rather than a slightly, one could say charitably, very inclusive, less charitably, one could say sloppy, attempt to raise doubts without specifying them about some or all of the specific provisions. So I wouldn't leap to the conclusion that the president has embraced or the president's constitutional advisors have embraced a constitutional critique of hybridity as such. Nevertheless, I think everything we have heard and said today raises a fascinating sort of tactical strategic question for South Africa, which I will pose again, if anyone wants to speak to it. And that is, given all the doubts that have been cast on the, uh, the manner in which the South African parliament, after thoughtful deliberation and, and, and a great deal of study, implemented its new, as distinct from its old, hybrid approach to copyright exceptions, might it be now time simply to go back to um, Peter's approach number one, the literal transplant approach in South Africa. In other words, if the objection is, is to fair use is, is around the fact that the South African language is not literally identical to US law and therefore might be vulnerable to a three-step critique, which might somehow be bootstrapped into a constitutional criticism, maybe tactically the best approach is simply to do a literal transplant in this next legislative round. I'd be curious, so that's an open question. And that leads me to my third area, which is the most speculative of the three, about which I know actually the little, the least because the the entity in question, the USTR, is of course a, a black box which does things without ever explaining them, or worse, fails to do things without ever explaining its failure. But we know a few things about the USTR in general and the the proceeding around the South African copyright amendment bill in particular, one of which won't surprise anyone and, and, and which um, may change in a short time. And that is that like every other aspect of the governance of the United States these days, the USTR's deliberations are obviously informed by neo-isolationism neo and casual racism. And that, I mean, and this, this is, you know, comes down from the top, right? This is, this is Trump's USTR, and we shouldn't be uh, mistaken about that. So I think in, in, in looking at the critique that the overt critique of the South African proposals that was offered to the USTR by the the uh, the industries by the recording industry and by IAPA and at looking at the action or inaction of the USTR since we have to be aware of the setting in which all of those issues have been raised so i find it very hard to take seriously the the critiques of the competence of the South African judiciary with respect to interpreting and applying fair use, or at least I, I, I can't take them seriously, nor can I think of them in isolation from the triumphal exceptionalism and, and racism of the Trump administration. Nevertheless, a, a question remains, and that is, if South Africa wanted to respond to the kind of bullying that the United States 
has been engaged in and which has been so influential on the presidential choice to, in effect, suspend work or rather to restart work on fair use in general and the copyright amendment bill, in, fair use in particular and the copyright amendment bill in general. What uh, what do we what we what do we derive from that? What 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 lessons about how to choose from Peter's list of options? What lessons about the considerations that Neva and Neil have raised concerning the localization of fair use concepts are are valuable in thinking about the next round at USTR, which will of course come when US industry routinely and emphatically objects again to whatever South Africa chooses to put in place. And I'll stop there. Great, let me, <clears throat> let me go ahead and take a few comments and, and questions and, and feel free to pose your questions, but let me encourage the panel not to answer them quite yet just so that we can get through, um, you know, a few different ones. And, and Ruth, I don't, I don't know if you are, uh, you know, pleased with your decision or go second, but now you've got a, a whole list of very interesting considerations to respond to, if you wish, or to make your own comments, but welcome. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And thank you to Peter and Neva and Neil for um, really um, thoughtful and compelling um, and somewhat uh, disconcerting um, presentations. A, a number of things that we'll reflect on on Peter's uh, comments, uh, Peter Yazi, not Peter Yu, um, on Peter's comments and also um, perhaps raise some other things um, for our discussion uh, this afternoon. So it was 10 years ago, actually this month, that I wrote um, the piece toward an international fair use doctrine. And um, in 2000, actually 20 years ago, in 2000, 2001, I had been concerned that what was really happening with the harmonization of copyright norms and the push toward a more rigid form of copyright lawmaking was an effort to undermine fair use in the United States. The, 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 the boomerang effect of um, US leadership in the Uruguay round and um, what we were seeing with the three-step test really was targeting um, US fair use and that there would be a need to recognize the importance of the fair use doctrine at a global level. And, and so safeguard not only US fair use, but the possibility of enacting similar statutes in countries um, around, around the world. And while we have not seen an explicit um, undermining of the fair use doctrine internally, I, I wonder if some of what both Peter's comments and what Neva and Neil's paper suggests is that indirectly, um, efforts both to resist the incorporation of fair use in local law um, and the more rigid reading of fair use in different jurisdictions um, may open doors to um, um, begin to wear away at the robustness um, of the fair use doctrine in principle and, and then ultimately obviously is applied um, around the world. So, so the strength of the courts and the strength of institutions in the local environment become a really important uh, piece um, of, um, of us thinking about the wisdom and the modalities of, of fair use in a global context. Um, and I'm kind of doing a 20 year reprise of that piece now, just thinking about some of these things. And so, um, you know, I'm curious to see especially if, um, Neva and Neil and Peter, how local institutions, um, the courts, I think Neva has spoken to this, um, whether they embrace this as an opportunity to make um, local law 
um, or whether they do view it as transplantation, because I think that sometimes psychologically affects how the courts embrace it, if they see it as a foreign doctrine. Um, even if it's in local statutes, their engagement with the spirit of that doctrine uh, can be somewhat different. Um, so that's something I'm curious about. And specifically, um, at, because I haven't read Neva Neal's paper yet, I'm so looking forward to it. I am curious as well, whether you see a distinction between fair use cases raised between two Israelis, mm. so locals, versus fair use cases that are raised between multinationals, which is what the Nestle case brings to mind. And the reason I ask that is because in every legal system, there is a set of normative, cultural, social expectations and values that are not often articulated in the decisions, but that come across in the expectations that courts have of certain behavior. So some things that might be acceptable um, between two Israeli citizens may not be viewed similarly if the case were to arise between two um, non-citizens um, or, or, or even when you've got one, an Israeli citizen and a non-Israeli on the other side. So I'm just curious whether in looking at the cases in Israel, um, you looked at that, at that dimension um, of it. And then I, I guess, you know, I want to really um, speak a little bit about fair dealing um, and fair use. Peter has very nicely, I think, set forth a, a, um, kind of, you know, this is really a spectrum. And in 2016, I think Peter and a few people on this webinar were all at a meeting um, in Singapore where we looked, it was a conference on comparative dimensions of limitations and exceptions. And I spoke on um, fair use and its values. And so we know actually that there are over 60 countries that have fair use in them today. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot of countries. Um, what I think is quite striking um, is what we've been referring to as hybridization, but I think is a little different. Um, many of the countries, so Antigua and Barbuda, for example, had in their law what they describe, the, the statute says it's fair dealing, but it is verbatim um, the fair mm -hmm. use um, provision. Um, from the U.S. statute. They just describe it, they just title it um, fair dealing. Mm -hmm. um, what's also interesting is that um, in that particular statute, when I was giving the talk in 2016, I made mention of, of how um, the expansion of fair use as a way of addressing um, the inability of local legislators to amend the law as easily. So for example, uh, fair use as an exception to moral rights um, um, and the application of fair use um, to photographs in, in some of these countries being treated very differently. So what we see, um, the, the malleability of fair use and fair use itself becoming transformative, I think is something we need to look at um, very carefully. Peter ref refers to this as customization, um, but obviously we also know that there are uh, consequences of that um, customization um, in particular. Um, so I, I guess I, I ask ultimately whether um, there are ways in which fair use itself um, may not so much be um, a, a tool to limit, um, um, uh, to counterweight and to provide opportunities to advance other social welfare goals, but whether fair use itself has become a medium of reform. And that may be something that in the South Africa case, we are clearly looking at, that is the fear mm -hmm that fair use will transfer power from the legislature to the courts in contexts where legislative control has been a really important part of controlling the political system or the political administration. So it's, I mean, you know, whatever USTR did, it did with the legislature. It could not have done that with the courts. 
and and there's a there's a way in which in in designing copyright law, um, particularly given its impact of the digital economy, we have to think about the institutional dimensions and what the malleability of fair use might look like in a context where political thought power is not easily transferable. Uh, that's, this is a great discussion. Thank you. <laughs> um, let me, I mean, I, I, I can turn back to the panel maybe for some brief responses. Let me encourage other people to, um, you know, raise your, your hand if you want to jump in. We, we had um, Stephen Hollis in the room, but I, I, I've been checking and I think he might have popped off. We actually talked with him a little bit beginning, but Neil, you had kind of re-raised his own point back to him to the extent that can you please tell me a little bit more about why hybridity is a criticism instead of, as Peter actually defined, Peter, you actually defined it, his thought kind of a value and, and something that you should strive for to make sure that you have a, a context specific application. If anybody wants to raise that point and, and kind of um, put a little bit more meat on that criticism, whether whether you know it from somewhere else or, or whether it's your own, I, I, I welcome you to jump forward. I also know Ben Cashton is in the room and he's um, part of a group that has been advocating for fair use from the perspective of creators. So it's a really interesting movement of documentary filmmakers and photographers and other people in the creative community who have who have been the voice in favor of fair use, um, allying themselves with libraries and educators, etc. Ben, I see you popped on. Do you want to do you want to make a comment, Ben? Do you want to come into the discussion? It's fascinating and disturbing and helpful and troubling. I don't know how many other uh, adjectives and adverbs I can throw in. It makes us feel like we are fighting a fight, not just for South Africa, but for the global community concerned with balanced and fair copyright. We sort of thought we might be, but we now feel it even more strongly. Uh, we will rise to that challenge. I spot out of the corner of my eye, one or two government leaders, uh, um, from South Africa um, who uh, may be listening in to the webinar. So we promise to sit down with them afterwards and analyze every word that has been said today and see how that can help us strategize in terms of our inputs to legislators uh, and others in South Africa. Um, you know, the bottom line in South Africa is we want some fair use. We don't mind whether it's hybrid. We don't mind whether it's, you know, open in this way or open in that way. Or, you know, Peter and Sean have taught us over the years that there are many ways to get fair use at the end of the day. We don't even care whether it's called fair dealing or fair use or fair anything or it's hybrid or it's not hybrid. We want the right to have, you know, um, an open set of circumstances under which it will be possible to make use of copyrighted works for fair and positive purposes. And we're absolutely certain, I think, Sean, you'll, if you haven't already, we can share with everybody the legal opinions we've commissioned in South Africa, because we're certain that the president has just slightly misstepped, to put it politely, in South Africa in his offering his concerns about fair use. But uh, We'd love for, to hear from everybody and anybody on this call who can give us more specific help as we expand and run our campaign over the coming months. Thank you. And I, f I feel like, Ben, if I, if I could just kind of prompt you further that, that you've, you know, you've got a very kind of articulate conception of where fair use fits in the decolonization of intellectual property from the standpoint of a documentary filmmaker who uses work to tell South African stories. You know, do you, do you want to comment a little bit on that, just, just for context? Well, I tell this story. I mean, I worked in the presidency in South Africa for um, uh, about a year and a half uh, when Mandela came into office. I had the honor of being summoned to be a minor advisor in his administration for about 18 months. And we arrived in the union buildings in, in South Africa 
a beautiful building designed by the same guy who did the parliament in, in Delhi and a few other colonial um, symbols. And when we got inside, it looked beautiful on the outside. When we got on the inside, there wasn't a network cable or a desk or a chair or a paper clip or a stapler left inside. So the, na the Nats, the nationalists, had, had removed everything. And that was sort of the beginnings of a realization that, that the whole system was rigged against us. And then, you know, as we came to work on the information economy as part of the job there in the presidency, we started to look into, um, you know, fights over intellectual property. The antiretroviral struggle in South Africa for affordable medicines was the first big struggle. But then later came to see through contact with Sean and others after I left that job, that all of the intellectual property revenue to, you know, to, to consider goes to Europe and, and the United States, 80%, I think, of IP royalties and last from figures from about 2015 go to Europe and the United States. Africa doesn't figure. So you realize that you know, IP royalties, IP payments, copyright payments um, are um, a tax on Africa, basically. I, I, as a documentary filmmaker, you referred to that specific example, I, I was trying to get footage of our struggle against apartheid, of the history of the struggle, of the issue of apartheid era debts that South Africa incurred. It's all owned by ITN and CNN and Reuters. None of it is owned in South Africa. So there is a sense in which fair use is a tool of decolonization of the creative and knowledge economy for South Africa in particular and Africa in general. Because until we have access to all that stuff, you know, Walt Disney can go on making Moana and the Lion King and all of that using our music and using, you know, African and um, developing country, in, you know, ideas. And we don't have access to, to any of the, the rest of the products of the world's, um, you know, creativity. So that's definitely one plank of our campaign in South Africa, fair use for decolonization and for access to education. I got to hop off shortly, but I'm going to be watching very carefully the transcript of the rest of your discussions. Thanks, Thanks. Sean. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Michael and Brandon, let me bring you in. Michael first, but you know, two members of our user rights network and scholars of fair use in their own right. So thank you for coming and we'd love to hear from you. I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Michael. I'm not sure why. I don't see you muted, though. Uh, Michael, I can't hear you. I think your mic, your microphone might not be connected. Can I give you a pause? Can we go to Brendan for a minute? Um, sure. There you go. There you go. We got you. Okay, so uh, uh, it's a pleasure to join everybody and and be here and. Uh, uh, pay a personal tribute to my mother's uh, South African homeland. Um, and uh, uh, just a couple of points that may, may add context uh, to, to the wonderful discussion and Neva's and Neil's papers and the other comments. Uh, almost all the countries, I think, uh, if, I haven't, if I'm not mistaken, on Peter Yu's uh, first slide, are uh, former colonies or mandates in, in the case of Israel. And all these jurisdictions have a rich experience with legal transplantation. Um, the entire legal system is, or was at the, at the beginning at least, um, a matter of legal transplant and has changed since independence in, in the different countries, of course. Uh, so that is one point. Uh, and that means that there is, at the core, there's a meeting place or meeting point between the global and the local, um, which is the legal transplant, which is, you know, the, the critical literature on Watson's uh, 1974 discussion emphasized that legal transplant is always a process. It's an ongoing process rather than a one-time copy-paste sort of, sort of thing. Uh, so specific different uh, contextual points between Israel and the US and presumably other countries, um, uh, uh, free speech. Uh, the US has the First Amendment and other countries, uh, other democratic countries do protect freedom of expression, but none to the extent that the US does. And uh, that 
plays a role in what can or cannot be done and it informs uh, the interpretation of, of uh, fair use uh, to, to a great extent. So that is one point about the legal environment. Another one about the legal environment and local context is uh, IP theory, uh, specifically copyright theory. So Israel has subscribed uh, explicitly, Supreme Court cases repeatedly say that we have the Anglo-American tradition, uh, which is an instrumentalist kind of view of uh, copyright. Nevertheless, there are also lots of other statements in uh, Supreme Court cases saying that, oh, copyright is IP and IP is property and property is property, you know, with all that kind of continental European uh, uh, weight. Uh, and then there's the cultural uh, environment, which I think Ben sort of came up in Ruth's, Ruth's question and Ben's comments. Uh, uh, the local cultural industries in Israel and, and elsewhere each has its unique features. Uh, and uh, for example, the local music industry in Israel, the musicians compete with each other, but with lots of mostly American uh, imports, whereas in other countries it might be more local or more American or more something else. Each country has its own uh, differences and that means that um, internal social, commercial, cultural norms among the players within, within each of these industries also interplays with the legal. Uh, and uh, sometimes there's a sort of a match and sometimes there isn't. And as Ruth, uh, uh, that was right on point, mentioned, when it's a foreign player and a local player, they, they do not share, do, do not necessarily share uh, the same cultural norms, etc. We see that increasingly over here in the case of uh, TV formats, which as you know is a big question, uh, you know, the extent of uh, are they uh, the works deserving of copyright or not, etc. Uh, Israel has had at least um, quite a vibrant TV format industry. I think now it's a bit declined. And uh, there have been some cases of foreigners against Israelis or Israelis against foreigners, and they do not share the same local norms. They might share some norms of some global TV community. Mm. Uh, so context. And that's all. Thank you so much once again. Brandon, Brandon, jump in. Hey, yeah. And, and so that's a great transition to what I was going to say, which is uh, that uh, in my work, uh, especially very recently in the work I've been doing uh, in fair use in the practice communities around software preservation, uh, the prospects uh, for expanding fair use, you know, around the globe is very tempting to that community and interesting to that community, not only uh, because it would be good to have everyone enjoy the benefits that the, the sort of American and other uh, fair use jurisdictions have, but also that they could together across borders. And so I know I raised this when Neva and Neil gave a talk on this paper earlier. Uh, in this series, um, but it, I think it goes to Peter's uh, point about customization as well. You know, a, a big downside and variation from jurisdiction to jurisdiction would be that um, practitioners might not be able to cooperate together in ways that they would like. Um, and so a literal network, you know, of practitioners sharing materials on the basis of what they would hope to be a uniform, you know, um, blessing from fair use across the jurisdictions um, could really be frustrated if it turns out that, uh, you know, every jurisdiction has its own flavor. So that's something that is very concerning to me in thinking about how fair use transplantation actually plays out. If it plays out in this very uh, customized way, you know, that could make it harder for us to do what we'd like to do. So Brandon, and this is a great point, and I really like the transition of the of the discussion into utility, right? What what might be the utility of of moving to a fair use regime? And and Brandon, if I can prompt you a little bit, you and I just participated, you know, over the summer in this um, course with 
techs and data mining researchers, right? And one of the things that uh, Matt Sag and I were asked to, to lecture on was, well, what do you do if you have a cross-border project? And we have all this great law that says you can do, you know, a lot of interesting things in the United States because all of this is transformative and non-consumptive. Um, but we created a map that showed how few countries have exactly that set of rules. And we had at least one researcher who was actually doing a cross-border project in Germany. And thank God, Germany has a very specific TDM research clause, so they could do it. But I don't know if you want to, maybe I just made my point that I was asking you to make, but if you want to comment. No, that's more, right. Because and, and, I know you work with a lot of TDM researchers in your practice. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Peter, jump in. No, no, you, you finish. I just had one response to Sean. I was just going to say the other, you know, the, the other ingredient here may be, you know, that um, we could, in terms of thinking about utility, the other thing to think about is um, whether we can mash together, you know, the, 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 the a, ha a hacked together kind of system where some activity happens in some places and some activity happens in other places um, so that, you know, uh, uh, the corpus, the TDM corpus lives on servers in the U.S. and you and you conduct your activity within the bounds of local law wherever you are. Um, but that, you know, that's all adding complexity to a, a to a system that's already fragile and, and, and barely getting off the ground. So that's a real problem. Peter, you wanted to jump in and then and then I saw, you know, a text in the in the chat, Neva, that was I think you could help respond to, but Teresa Nobre was also kind of asking, well, what, what kind of evidence of utility? Maybe you could tell the education story of kind of, you know, how, how it takes more than just the legal change. It might take a best practices exercise, et cetera, to kind of achieve the actual social change you might be looking for. But just very quickly, in. in terms of Brandon's dilemma, which I think is, it's a very good case study of something that is probably reproduced in a dozen other areas of, of specialized activity. And my observation is simply that as difficult as it may be to get to an international position in which many countries have something like a corresponding fair use standard, it would be probably infinitely more difficult to get 60 countries to adopt a, a reasonably similar special exception for software preservation. So in the absence of international treaties in the area, which eh, I'm not so confident that we're going to get, um, it seems to me that uh, difficult as it may be, doing something along the lines of, of, of the the objective that Ruth announced and and continues to pursue doing something to get toward sort of bottom-up harmonization of general open flexible exceptions may not only be uh, intellectually defensible but actually unbelievably it may be the most practical approach. Neva do you want to yeah. you know do you want to comment because you know you're story to some extent is about how fair use kind of got restricted, but I know you also have an educational story about how it was made useful. I think that might be really interesting to share. I know there's some people from South Africa in the audience that their job may yeah. be to figure out how to implement fair use. Yeah, I, um, I want to say something about it, but first to um, actually comment about the, I think, uh, Ruth, really important point about the um, um, global uh, political economy and the way in which uh, there is a fear of uh, allocating more power to courts, you know, within countries as part of a global, uh, you know, as, as an effort to uh, sustain some ha uh, hold on uh, uh, global standards. And I think that in terms of our case study, uh, what we have seen is an independence of the courts, so that the courts did not um, count at all American 
uh, uh, case law, right? There was very little reference in Israeli courts to American case law, despite the fact that uh, in Supreme Court cases, we've seen more reference of that sort, mm -hmm. but uh, as a general matter, there was very little, you know, the courts just um, uh, were, you know, felt very comfortable um, creating their own interpretation and develop the doctrine based on the principles that, there are legal principles. I don't think it's political and I don't think that there is any, um, you know, I, I think that it, it would be really interesting to, to look for some uh, difference in the way courts are treating, you know, maybe foreigns and locals. It, this, is, this is a great agenda for another, empirical study, but I, I think that this is something intuitively, I don't think that we find something like that, but I think it would be really interesting to look for it. But I think that the point is that the court has a logic of its own. And I think that judges are holding on to this because they are trained by this. It's an institutional uh, past dependency that is really powerful. As for what is happening outside the court, and thank you, Sean, for mentioning this. This is something that is not related to this particular study, but it's something that um, I've been uh, actually doing uh, both as an activist and as a researcher, um, a work that I've, you know, I've been doing with uh, Professor Orit Fishman of Fori, uh, and that has had to do with uh, 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 taking advantage of the opportunity that we introduce fair use in Israel in order to establish best practical for our educational, uh, higher educational institutions. And that is something where, um, you know, that ha it has reached the courts, but has ended up in a settlement. So what we have done is that we have built a coalition of higher all the higher education institutions in Israel to self-define the um, scope of fair use for educational purposes. This has been challenged by the, uh, the, by the publishers in court and ended up in a settlement um, five years ago where that actually endorse the um, um, best practices that we have unilaterally drafted uh, as higher education institutions um, uh, for what you can and you cannot do under fair use uh, um, for teaching purposes. Um, so far, it has not been challenged again. So the settlement was for a couple of years, you know, this has ended five years ago. And so far, we haven't seen any other new lawsuits. So I think a, on the ground, what we have seen is an enormous change where higher education institutions were able to actually assert their rights under fair use to provide access to educational materials uh, for, you, for the students uh, without having to litigate this or risk or you know, um, and avoiding the chilling effect of uh, risking uh, court litigation. So I think in terms of uh, changing the reality in education, this has been a tremendous achievement for the legal reform and the introduction of fair use. It's such an important example. I know, I know Denise Nicholson, who is um, one of the leading uh, copyright librarians uh, for the university sector in South Africa. She works at the University of Eswatastrom, but she's really a leader, you know, nationally is on the, on the call. And it's such an important, um, you know, case study and, and example for them. It, it reminds me of this, you know, Robert Hale, I think in the 1930s, described law as setting up the background rules against which negotiations take place mm -hmm. that ultimately determine the price right. at which goods and services are, are displayed. So the real effect isn't going to be, dis you know, under that kind of legal realist line of reasoning, the real effect isn't going to be seen in the cases, right? It's going to be seen in the incremental, the, 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 the degree to which bargaining power changes against the background of that rule. So for instance, you know, Ben gives his example of like, what do I do? I'm trying to access this material for my documentary film. If you've got a fair use clause, 
it creates a different negotiation with that foreign entity that you're trying to get it from, right? And and I know all of Peter's work is basically, well, not all, but a substantial part of Peter's work over the last uh, couple of decades has been proving that point and demonstrating the utility if people take advantage of it, if people decide, you know, what they need it to be. Um, yeah. Indeed. I, I want to, oh, yep, yeah, go for it, Peter. Oh, just to say that, that that's absolutely right and it's really important. And I would love the, the, the di somehow if there were a way of expanding this discussion in South Africa a little bit to talk about all the things that, you know, to the extent that uncertainty about how fair use is going to work is a real concern uh, rather than a, a, a window dressing for something else. Uh, I would love to see this discussion expanded to include a consideration of all the things that a civil society and a legal system can do when change happens to increase the, the, the predictability and the comfort with which people rely on the doctrine. And these best practices in various forms are an example of that. They're not the only example. There are other things. Judicial education is a thing, and, and we could make a list, but they're one thing. If one were really concerned, genuinely concerned, about the difficulty of this transition, then one could address that um, expressly. So I think, you know, we've got about 20 minutes left. And I want to come back to all the panel members just for any reflections. There's been a whole ton of different questions that, that one could answer to. And Peter, you, we've, we've talked, you know, I think we've really built upon a lot of your work on the hybridity in this discussion. Um, do you want to, you want to comment on, on any of that? You know, is hybridity, is that a benefit or a detraction from a statute? Or please bring in any reflections you've had during this conversation. I'm for some reason not hearing you, Peter, but you're not muted. And we heard you before. I'm not sure if it's our side or your side. No. I think it it must be your side. You're not muted. I think I try not. No. Okay, let me um Neil, can we, why don't we go to you, Neil? Just any reflections, we'll come back to Peter. Peter, I think it must be your microphone somehow. Oh. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I, I want to go back to, uh, <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yes. Kind of Ruth's initial point, which was to, to wonder whether U.S. copyright industry opposition has to do with an antagonism to fair use in the United States. Um, and I think it's- You can answer that question if you want. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, you know, we write about this in our, in our article, but I mean, I, I, I still find it shocking that, um, that the U.S. proposal for TRIPS way back when, which was largely pushed by the corporate industries, would, would have limited fair use to the fourth <laughs> So, uh, And in making the claim today, um, that, you know, there's instance after instance where the U.S. corporate industries say, you know, Fair use is pretty certain in the United States, you know, after you know, we have uh, decades and decades of jurisprudence, uh, it's, uh, it's in the United States, uh, the courts can handle it, it's certain, but there would be complete chaos and piracy in other countries. Um, and then they describe fair use in the United States and basically they're describing like a, a very stripped down version of what fair use really is in the United States, right? Uh, so they have this kind of wrong, narrow ideal of fair use that they're juxtaposing against um, the possibility for greater mm -hmm. in other countries and the United States. So I, I definitely think there's um, a lot of that there. You want to try? Actually have a, oh, sorry. Yes. A, can you hear me? Yeah, so keep one, going, Neil. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. I actually just going to throw out a question. Um, yeah. If anyone has any information, I'd love, love to. to it uh, maybe for our article, but um, you know, 
I've heard a number of instances where um, reports, informal reports, that it's not just the U.S. carpet industries that have directly lobbied against fair use in other countries, but that U.S. government officials have also taken an active role. Um, but I've never seen any uh, sort of reportable um, evidence of that. Um, so if anyone has that, I'd be very interested in, in seeing it and receiving it. Um, uh, Peter, then Ruth. Peter, you, then, then Ruth. So you can hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. So let me start with the observations about South Africa. And now I've got to um, uh, the uh, observations from Ruth as well as Brandon. I think they are, they are uh, both provocative and interesting. So with respect to South Africa, I think there are two different issues. One is whether the statute actually meets the three-step test. And I don't want to spend time rehashing that type of argument because that happens in virtually every jurisdiction trying to push for uh, fair use reform. And I think a lot of people would basically see that as a red hearing. Uh, I think the, the, to the extent that uh, if we're in a political situation that we have to address the issue, I think the best approach is basically what South uh, Korea has done uh, to incorporate the two steps within the provision of the fair use provision to avoid some of those issues. But at the same time, I think for a lot of us, we actually do not believe that we need to uh, go in that direction. Uh, the second one, which is actually started from the uh, very beginning of the discussion is about the hybridity. I think uh, Neil, uh, Peter and others are correct in the sense that uh, we have the hybrid system in virtually every uh, corporate systems uh, that include fair use and fair dealing. And I think uh, the US is a very good example uh, so if you look at, for example, teaching, uh, Section 12D of the uh, South African uh, uh, bill, uh, we include something that we have in Section uh, 110 of the corporate statute, as well as maybe a teacher act and others. And so that is actually very similar. We have Section 107 for fair use, and then we have specific provisions for education. And that will be very similar to what we have in Section 12D of South Africa. But I also think that the critics are uh, correct in some way in the sense that uh, some of the provisions within section 12b are normally included within fair use but not